talking about this guy. There you go. Okay. And then four thirty one Dodge. This says it's 445 East Dodge. I think I was on the right house. to not be it's on the north side tell. that's been kind of um, retooled there so it looks a different okay um other than these two properties do you guys have any specific ones that you feel is appropriate to add on that you know off the top of your head so there was a couple places in there where they actually identified not so much the structure, but the location. Mm -hmm. um, so the original location of the uh, Ralston house or the Ralston business is commercial is right here on the corner of Oak and Main, okay. uh, Larry Spires building. Okay. Since kind of kitty corner on the lot, the lot, the building is an old, right. but according to that narrative, that's where his business was, Ralston's business. Okay, so I think like some of the ones that I've, I could be remembering it wrong, but the ones that I think of, of the locations, like Ralston Park mm -hmm. was included as a location, um, I think partially because of the gazebo, partially because it's named after a historical person as well. Um, but it is a public space that is left open mm -hmm. and then there's markers there that identify the historical value of, of the area, right? Um, so to add a property like that, I think we would have to work through what it would look like for us to put that on the historical registry to, to be able to capture that as part of the property. Um, okay. I'd have to do some research of how we would do that. Um, yeah, yeah and I'm not, I don't know that Larry would be amenable to doing it, but. Because um, that is the other thing is that the property owners have to be willing participants in right. being listed. Right. They have to be willing participants to be unlisted as well, which is why we'd have to get the approval to be able to remove the 18 parcels. What are the advantages to them? Notoriety. Um, I, being, there, there is some value to being able to say that you have a historical property. Um, I'm not sure if it equates to a financial strategy, but it's it about a half award too. Yeah. 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 Um, so I guess one question would then turn into there was a large procedure in the 1990s to try to capture historical properties. The efforts maintained until 2004. So we have some properties. I don't imagine all property is captured from the 70s. Is there a desire of the commission, and I'm not advocating one way or the other, but is there the desire of the commission to go through any process to evaluate the era of the 1970s to see if there's any historical heritage value of adding that into the historical context statement and adding additional properties? Well, if it somewhat looks like it's original, Self, I mean, like original from the like, 1970s. Like this house right here looks like uh, it's been remodeled probably a couple of times and maybe got an addition to it or something. Um, why would we wait for the European copy to be 
qualifies as that particular opinion. So I would limit the search to the how she presented that opinion. Because that's quite obvious, that's down there. Yes. And so the through the last process and in my review of it, you know, three quarters of the town met the qualifications to be listed as a historical place, right? But if you look at the majority of the properties that are listed, they went through the historical context statement and they identified that there was a tie to a lot of these properties or the house or the structure that was there was a quintessential archi architectural, you know, demonstration of the architecture of the time sort of thing, right? So it was either tied to a historical person of value in the community, or it was tied to the architecture that maintained the character of the, the time. Um, the purpose of the city doing it, or the state doing it, or the National Register doing it, is to be able to capture the historical value within the community. Um, as Dave has asked, there's, you know, what's the value of a property owner listing themselves as historical? Um, unless you are an enthusiast for it, there tends to be a higher cost and a greater level of restriction of maintaining a historical property. And so there's not a, a, a significant push of private property owners to come forth and say, I want to be listed as historical unless it looks like the old bush house or a couple of these old victorians just around the street right where you're just like we we're proud of this we want to maintain it we have the passion for it and so the community as a whole has identified in the code and in the 1990s and in in our um comprehensive plan that historical preservation is a role and responsibility of the city that we want to ensure that we're maintaining the heritage of the community and we're preserving properties that have created a value to our history sort of thing. Um, and so in this next step, it would be, you would go through a process and it is not a required process. You can say, no, we don't want to, to, to do this process this time. There hasn't been enough time since the last time we did it. Um, you can go through the process and say, well, we think that the 1970s was an important era in the community because of X, Y, and Z. So you would do the research, you would go through and modify that big book, the historical context statement to say, in the 1970s, these were important people within our community. These, the, the architecture of the time had a specific style to it, like Art Deco became popular during the 60s and the 70s. Um, do we have any buildings that promote that that specific style sort of thing. Um, and then the city would make the decision to amend the context statement to include that part of the history and then identify <clears throat> those specific properties that are appropriate. It is a choice. It is not a requirement. Um, if the commission does not feel that there's been enough time between the last time that we did this, because there are some properties that were captured from the 1970s, that's pretty much the only decade that's yeah. eligible right now and the elder, uh, older than 50s that hasn't already been captured, I think. Um, and so it, it's up to the commission of whether or not you want to take on that project or not. Got a couple of quick questions. <clears throat> um, there was, maybe Don can answer this, there was two major growth spurts to Lebanon. So after World War II, major what? growth spurts. Was after World War II and then back in the 60s. And <clears throat> don't remember World War II, but I do remember the 60s. You don't? <laughs> so, yeah. I think that's, that's what I saw somewhere. And the second question is, do they have to be inside the city limits? No, you do have some properties already that are within the UGB. Like the, Gra yeah. the Grange building um, huh. is on the historical list, but it is outside city limits, but it is within the UGB. And there was two of them on Cascade further out. Are they both in the UGB? Oh gosh, I hope so. Uh, Berlin, the rock quarry, is that in? The rock quarry is within the UGB, okay. yeah. <clears throat> so, I guess I have one more question. 
Mm -hmm. So if we decide um, property on this area, there's an obligation of the property owner. So our code, which kind of can bleed into the next section too, um, our code allows for, it provides the process to add a property to the list, provides a process to remove the property from the list. Ultimately, it is a, a it is voluntary, right? Um, it is a requirement of the property owner to agree to be on the list um, in the first place. So even if you go through and say, we want to add this new decade, we want to go through this process and we think that there's 20 properties that are eligible we would go through the process of reaching out to those 20 properties and if only eight of them agree to be included on the list then only eight of them agree to be on the list and then once you agree to be on the list then there are triggers and requirements in which you are to preserve the property in that historical character sense so yes they are agreeing to that by being if you agree to be on the list, you're agreeing to adhere to the requirements to preserve it in that nature. So how is that initiated? Just send them a letter? We would go through a process of saying, yes, we want to do this. These are the properties as part of this group that we feel that we should do it. Um, we would then initiate a contact with them by sending them letters, following up with any phone calls or anything like that and for any form of communication and have a time period for them well, to we respond. need a list of pros and cons. Yeah. Bring them to the property. Absolutely. Yes. Until which time they decide they do oh, not yeah. want to be on the registry right. list and then they have to go through the process of saying, I don't want to be on the list okay. anymore. Goes before the planning commission, well, the historic landmark commission. To say that we want to have this property removed because it is it's part of the code that says that they have to be on the list for extension is there currently a fee for them to do this yes how much is that fee uh you since it is it's a public hearing process so it'd be fifteen hundred dollars if to put it on the list we would make that as a as part of the committee process to update the list but to remove a property from the list once they agree to be on it it's subject to a public hearing procedure. And so that would be, we would then have to go through. That would probably process. discourage a lot of them that they had to pay $1,500 to be on the list. I think if somebody is willing to be on the historic registry, they fall under that passion and that desire of my property is a cool property that denotes the era in which we're trying to, and I want to be on the list, so. So I maybe have a legal question then. If a property on the historic register changes hands and the new buyer didn't know it, uh, are they still bound? When they come in for a, yes, right? Because it's still on the list. It's an approved as part of the list. Um, so they would be bound to it. And then if they ever come in for a, a permit, we would say, hey, you're on the historic registry. You would have to go through this process. Then if they're all upset about being on the historic registry, I don't want to be on the historic registry, then we would say, well, okay, here's the process you would do to remove yourself from said registry. Gone. But you said it was going to cost $1,500. Yeah. Does that show up in their title, sir? No, it doesn't. Well, that's not the job. And that's exactly, that's what made me ask it. Yeah. Uh, because I just last, two weeks ago, was involved in one of the properties that's on the list. And it was never disclosed. It wasn't on the prelim or anything. Do they have to disclose it? Well, it to if the new buyer was going to do something with the property, uh, they would need to know that. I mean, it, it anyway. could scuttle their plans for all intents and purposes. Right. And in this case, I know there's been some talk about tearing the building down. Well, it might be just the fact that the homeowner, the current homeowner, Yeah, I'm, I'm, we're catching up with it just as much as you guys are. Right? It, it has not been an active program. Um, yeah. It clearly hasn't been a deterrent, <laughs> um, but it hasn't been an active program in terms of our function as a commission. 
Um, and so we're bringing that back. How it all works are all very good questions where we'll have to, to work through that to make sure that it's, it's being addressed. So we could add something uh, to the code that states that they have to disclose that if they sell the place? I would have to identify whether or not that is something that can be added to the code with the city attorney because it's a legal document for disclosure procedures. Um, but I think it's just an added form that you could put in for a common one. So I, I could imagine that it's something, but that's a possibility if you want to amend the code. Um, well, it would be just, I don't know that you'd have to amend the code, uh, but once a property is approved for the register, just simply record it. Yes. And that would be for any new property that's part of the registry. That wouldn't come out in the just how search there. Maybe the covenant and restrictions. Well, if it's recorded, then they would find it. Okay, that's I guess that's what I'm I was getting. I, I would think it would be recorded if you're it, not, it should have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it might be considered a CCR too. Well, CCNRs for something that old would have, would be expired, and that's not uh, uh, legally enforceable other than by the community. So the city or somebody couldn't enforce that anyway. Um, but should be some notification, I would think. I would hope so. I, I there are several properties which you would go and buy. If you look down the street, you'd go. I'm pretty dang sure that's a historical property. There are some other properties that, that are on this list where, um, frankly, when I look at some of them, I'm like, I can't tell if that's new construction or if that's just really <laughs> well-maintained old construction, right? Yeah. Like um, the property off of, I think it's Park now. What's the one just east of Park? Grove. Thanks. Property off of Grove by, by a church. Um, when I walk by it, I'm like, hey, that looks like new construction, but it's on the registry. And and it it's, it's probably really well maintained because I look at the Loon County assessors and it says it was built in 1905. And I'm like, well, that's great maintenance, but it looks like the craftsman style type home that's being built right now is the, the subdivision type, but it's on the list. And so it's it would be subject so to it. Your bones are old, but and all that. Potentially, yeah. So I just thought of two more houses that are right straight down the street here. Um, 313 Third Street. Um, it's actually where my wife is. It's a care facility. Okay. Uh, and it supposedly was built before the turn of the century. Okay. And then on the west side, almost straight across the street on the west side, uh, I don't know the address, is a big two-story uh, that I sold way back in the 90s but it was also built before the turn. Okay. So how about we do this? Um, Cause I think right now we're all thinking about other properties. Why don't we make it a homework assignment <laughs> for you all to, um, if you have properties in mind, verify the addresses of those properties, make drive by them, make sure those are the properties that you're thinking of and then provide those to me as a direction of we're going to provide this list. And then I can come back with, okay, this is the compiled list that we're thinking of. Um, and then identify what the next steps are. Um, if we're only talking about the properties that you're talking about seem to fit within the existing historical context statement that exists and might have just not been included in the original cycle. Um, and so they're turn of the century homes or, or far exceeding 50 years old sort of thing. Those don't necessarily feel like it needs to go through a full update process. That does feel like it could just be something where the Historic Landmark Commission would make the recommendations that they should be on the list, direct staff to go make contact to see if they're willing to be on the list or not. Um, and if they are, then it would be the Historic Landmark Commission's recommendation to the city council that these be added to the list. And then in their in term, we can figure out and make sure that they have the appropriate disclosures as part of recording it against the property. Um, how does that sound? Yeah. So going back to the uh, properties where it no longer applies, if it was a historical building at one point in time, but the building is no longer there, it's just a lot, yeah. or the lot has been repurposed into something else. I, 
I don't know what does that process need to look like again to uh, remove those. We just recommend that uh, we remove those. And does that would that cost the uh, current property owner? No. So that process would be you would direct staff to make contact to those 18 property owners. And I'd go back through the list and verify that it's indeed 18, not 17 or 20 or whatever it would be. I would go back to the list and, and verify that they, that property is indeed no longer subject to the historical context that it was approved as. And then we would make contact with the property owners to say, mm -hmm. you're on the list, however, it doesn't exist anymore. Please approve us removing the list or let us know that you don't want to be removed. Um, and then wh whoever we hear back from over a specific time period, we would then come back to the Historical Landmark Commission and say, this is the list that is being recommended to be removed based off of your direction. This is the list that has come back to us saying, yes, they're willing to be on the Historical Registry uh, based off of your direction. Now, Historical Landmark Commission, do you want to recommend to the City Council these amendments to the Historical Registry? That's the process that we would go through. Is that on that property? Well, they segregated it off the property. Okay. And it's like Park Street and off Park Street as the other. Okay. Um, but it still goes to the city council. Okay. Um, so I don't know if that it was a part of this. I think if it was moved, then that probably still counts as part of its intended historical registry. Okay. But I don't have that knowledge basis like you do. And so that's, you know, we look at the property and go, there is clearly an apartment complex here, yeah, right? Because it's right, it's right behind it. They just removed, so they, they built those apartments and they donated the Okay. So for instances like that, what I would say is that would be a correction to the historical okay. registry and an update to it. That okay. building exists. It would be better classified under this address, not that address. So and then since you are, you yeah. And then, and then, so that's part of your homework assignment, I guess, is to verify what we have on the list here is accurate. Okay. Right. So it's like, there's one on here where it, it's for the masonry lodge, right? And it just shows a picture of Growler Cafe. But if you go around the corner, the other side of the building has the entrance to the, the masonry lodge that we just had restored sort of thing, right? So it's like the picture's not right. Intent was there, but the picture's not the, the correct location of it. And so we would just need to clean a little bit of that up. But um, so if you want... Yes. Yep, and then for like... This one, since it is technically on a different property, I would think since you own it, we would be contacting you to say, please verify that you actually are going to maintain this. So, yeah. So is there any direction or desire to go through the whole process of amending the historical context statement to include anything from the 1970s and go through and evaluate properties of that era? Well, we can only go to 1972, right? Yes. You know, I read it, but I didn't read it with that in mind. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Uh, we don't need to do it. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I, I would uh, opt to not 
um, I think that there may be value to um, just educate the public generally and if anyone wants to kind of pull us to um, solicit their own input on it uh, for consideration, maybe a better way to go rather than us trying to just fast track the whole in that area well if, if that was the desire of the commission my follow-up recommendation would be that that should go as a recommendation to the city council who i would then assume would put together an ad hoc committee made up of members from say the museum foundation who has a severe interest in this kind of thing that would be willing to do the work and the research associated with it with it which is very similar to the process that happened the last go around um but i don't I, I like the idea of wait, educate, and and go forth from there. Because it's voluntary, right? For any property owner, they can either be on it or not, or choose to be removed from. Um, yeah, that's kind of the lens I was. Yeah. Okay. So, I've got a really basic question, um, and don't read into it. But when I was reading up on this and thinking about it. It, I had to wonder, is this the correct body to apply this? I know by statute, or I mean by rule, we are. Mm -hmm. But uh, it would seem to me that it may, be, it may better serve the community if it was staffed by some citizens with that kind of passion. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's, to me, it's extremely interesting but I don't know that I have the passion to uh, follow through like maybe it should. And I'm speaking for me, <laughs> don't misunderstand me, nobody else. Uh, so it just made me wonder because I know back in the 90s uh, when this was going, uh, we had several discussions about it and the ones that were really pushing it, I mean, that put this together, uh, they were passionate, big time passionate. Uh, and it makes me wonder if that's not what it would take to make this go forward. So I think that the Historical Landmark Commission is there for two purposes. What we've been talking about so far is the evaluate every 10 years of whether or not that's something that we want to, to pursue or not, right? The other part, which is kind of the next part of the agenda, is whenever somebody is going to amend or modify, construct, do improvements to a historical structure, it needs to be evaluated by a commission to determine whether or not it meets the decision criteria, identifying that it's maintaining the character and the historical nature of the property, which falls perfectly in line with the roles and responsibilities that the planning commission usually mm -hmm. adheres to. And so that's where I say that aspect is the bread and butter of this board who is used to making those types of decisions, who is used to looking in the lens of evaluating a project based off of the decision criteria. When it comes to whether or not to update the historic registry or not, or do this larger process, that is where I would sit there and say that that should fall under the, the you make a recommendation to council Council creates that ad hoc committee of those that are truly passionate and knowledgeable of it to do that work. And then that work would come ultimately to the planning, the historic landmark commission body for final adoption or recommendation of adoption to the city council. So you would still have your eyes on it in terms of are these properties under the historical context statement that has now been drafted that we can then apply these existing decision criteria to, or do we need to amend the decision criteria? Um, so you would have, you could have that role in it, but when it comes to doing the work associated with, are we going to bring forward all these additional properties and modify that that statement? I would put that as that recommendation under the ad hoc committee. And I'd be good with that because I'd hate the ones that are really passionate about this. I hate to leave them out of the process. Oh yeah. But the older ones, you know, the, the 1800s and early 1900s, I think, are the ones that are the most passionate. I think the older homes have a lot more character. Than 
I said they were more aggressive. Yeah, that's they were more cookie cutter kind. Well, of it is it possible to categorize that list, like pre 1900, uh, 1900 to 1950, or is there some way to do that? I'm 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 pretty sure. Yeah, I have dates of construction for each of these, so we would be able to filter them through and then put them in chronological order and put them by decades to show the progression of the type of style. Um, I think Dave made a really good point of when was Lebanon, when was our booms? And it was turn of the century in 1950s and World War II era Lebanon, right? So right now that is encaptured in the historic context statement in this registry. Um, I have a feeling that these addresses that you're probably listing off are not included on it because the property owners didn't want to be included on it, but they may want to now. Um, but uh, I think it's a very good point to say, was there anything of significance that occurred in Lebanon's history during the, that new time period that's not captured here yet? that would have a value in going and going through this process. And it doesn't sound like there has been a significant event that occurred in the city that would be captured in this process is what I'm hearing. Another thing, another thought that I had was, so the, the only incentive for these property owners to be on this registry is self-fulfillment, right? Like, Pretty much. I mean, just feel good about themselves. Yeah. So to encourage, if, if this is gonna be done, perhaps the city should do something to encourage these people to put their homes on the registry to spend that $1,500. For example, um, free dinner at Sherry's <laughs> or, <laughs> or a break on their water bill or something, you know, or t some kind of tax break or permit Permits, uh, you know, half price or whatever. Or even so, they're saying the the what is it? Our permit that you were saying that they had to give was like the because we talked about grants before. Yeah. You know, maybe to people that have existing homes, they like we were talking about the Jonathan House that has that is that beautiful. You know, everything it requires all the different paint and yeah. or whatnot was like what sixty thousand or something like you said. So maybe having. That can come out as a recommendation of the Historic Landmark Commission, but that should be considered as something for the city council to look at. I, I, yeah, I, I agree. They're not cheap to do. Right. Um, and so they're beautiful. You would never, I mean, I wouldn't want to lose them. I think they're, they're a great thing for the buildings and stuff like that in our So, so what kind of an incentive are you thinking? It would be like a facade improvement program where the city could put five or ten thousand dollars towards the improvements that your property would make as part of the historical registry. Or an interest-free loan. We we would have to we would have to work through all of that to to figure out where the money would come from, how it would be structured. But what we can take it as a recommendation of the historic landmark commission that this should be pursued bring it forth to the city council. They do it on Main Street. So they have a, a, year, a few years back, they started um, rebuild Main Street or something um, as a nationwide uh, grant process that they were doing. And so our Main Street is in part of that. And, and the, the Lebanon Downtown Association works with ARISA, um, I think for economic analysts. Mm -hmm. And they have grants that come through that they can offer $5,000 grants to help with the windows or like keeping them within the time period but it just updates them to to a new modern like the glass is thicker or whatnot to help with energy efficiency doesn't the doesn't the city of lebanon give about forty five thousand a year to the downtown association for the purpose of no. revitalizing the downtown or? so the city funds through the transit lodging tax um, $25,000 to the downtown association as part of the main street manager position. 
and then we have a fifty thousand dollar grant fund which is what tina is talking about to provide those facade improvements for the downtown as an effort to spur tourism into our downtown area so that is a similar type of a concept project of what we would be talking about as an incentive of if you're going to be on the historical registry we can provide that type of funding source i'm just thinking if i can ask dave on this one if we are soliciting we are we are actively identifying properties and soliciting property owners to pique their interest on joining the uh, registry at their cost mm -hmm. and money i just don't know how many takers you'll we'll get uh for that it just seems um it would why would it cost them if we're well, personally, I would have a hard time with somebody that comes to me and asks me to spend my money to do something for them well, okay. <laughs> without any kind of incentive. And that's basically what we're talking about here. So let me, <laughs> let me clarify. It would be the direction of the Historic Landmark Commission to some of these properties that have been listed and the ones that you guys are going to have your homework to go do and identify. Because it is a Historic Landmark Commission that is taking on the decision to try to add these properties to the list, that process would not be a cost to the property owners. That is the work that the Historic Landmark Commission has told us to pursue. The cost is only incurred in the future down the line if they no longer want to be on the list that they have such volunteered to be part of, then the cost would be the process of going through the public hearing procedure to be removed. To be removed. Got it. So there is no cost. There is be, no upfront. There is no upfront cost. There is only the cost to be removed. Got it. Okay, that's where my maybe misunderstood. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, we, so to wrap up this part of the conversation, because we have ten minutes left, it appears the direction is for the landmark commission to over the next month identify specific addresses and properties that they think would be eligible for us to pursue a, a conversation with the property owners to see if they want to um, participate in it to double check our work of the historic registry if you have any working knowledge like tina and dave and don and anybody else who's been here for a while might know uh, check our list to make sure that it's not incorrect or invalid in any way shape or form then at the next meeting that we have for the Historic Landmark Commission, we'll bring that forward to identify which properties we're officially going to pursue. We can further discuss this incentive concept. And then once we do all of that work, we'll wrap it up as a recommendation to the city council as part of the historic board. Does that sound good? Well, to actually to really be effective, somebody needs to drive around and look at every one of these properties. Yes, which is what we did with a mix of driving around, double checking, and then also Google Maps images, which How are- How current are these pictures that we have? As current as Google Maps are, oh. so within the last couple of years. But like Tina talked about the Queen Anne, we look at it and go, there's an apartment complex there. She knows the history that, hey, that actually has been moved, and so we need to readdress that. So if you see any glaring things where something should be there, but it's not, or it's been changed, that's what we kind of want to look at. Keep this in your car or truck, Dave, when you're driving uh, around. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> just want to make a point. I was looking through the book here in Chapter 7. There's recommendations in 1994 of what you should do with these pieces. And literally, um, we're talking about the exact same thing. Just saying. Brilliant. There's nine recommendations in here. One being the one that Dave recommended. Owners of properties eligible for the National Register should be notified and encouraged to place their property in the National Register. A large number of blood men properties should be placed in the National Register. I know we're talking about National Register, not but, um, through the multiple property submission. The National Register is voluntary and only those property owners wishing to have their property placed in the registry would be included in such nomination. Blah, blah, blah. Um, they're also recommending we want to keep the oldest house in the town, which is the Elton House Home, 1857. And they said back then they said we need to figure out a way to find solutions to keep the preservation of that house. Have you done that? Is it still there? I don't know. That's on Main Street. When was that written? Huh? When, when 1994? 1994. I mean, like, exactly what we're talking about. We're pretty good. It, it, 
<laughs> I'm only 20 years late here. I, I was only five years old. <laughs> So the next part of the discussion, which we're technically supposed to be doing every year, is the review the decision criteria in which you guys are to make decisions on. Um, I have included that in the packet, so I, I hope everybody read the decision criteria. It would be staff's recommendation that since we haven't applied the decision criteria, there's probably not a reason to change it until we try to apply it first and, and, and see if there's anything that needs to be changed. And, and, and but if you all would like to pursue doing any modifications of it, let me know. Sounds to me like if we're going to do our homework, we're going to need to have another meeting in a month or two months. Yes. Um, could we kick the can down the road to that meeting? Sure. Because. Um, Speaking for myself again, uh, I wasn't sure what to expect. Yeah. So now I've got a little better handle on what we're looking at. Um, I'd like to go back and look at it with a little different eye. Okay. Is that okay with everybody? And we'll be done. Um, and then I guess as one little last uh, item of, of interest, um, the city of Lebanon has a property on the historic registry. Um, which we will be going through the process as we have the right to do to request for it to be removed from the historic registry. Um, this is the old water treatment plant that's just downtown area or south of downtown. Um, it's got a very cute brick building that, that looks very lovely and historical, but everything behind it and everything in it is um, dangerous and needs to be removed so that we can actually have the property safe for people to, to be on. Um, and so it would be our intention to move forward with the removal process for that property. So you're going to pay us $1,500, right? Yeah, where does that I'm going to pay my go? one hand to the other $1,500. <laughs> yeah, just to fix the whole entire building. Is that what we're, we're actually going through a process with SHPO right now where we'll have to do some documentation of that because I think it's on well, I don't know. I don't think so. But Might be on the are, state. It could be on the state. So we're, we're going through that process right now. But the building itself is it's just brick masonry. There's no structural supports to it. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> we've gone through, we've already started removing asbestos. We've had abatements done. We've got chemicals to remove. It's, it's quite a process. All right. Anything else? So, do we want to establish a time to pick this up again? Uh, do you all feel that one month is sufficient time to do your? Homework, or do you want to punt to the July meeting? You have a preference. July meeting. July. I vote July. Yeah. Okay. You get to shake your head. I agree. July is fun. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be a nay somewhere. <laughs> I'm just thinking I'm gone with the gym. <laughs> okay. So we can reconvene in July with these updates that we've talked about. Yep. Perfect. Very good. Okay. All right. With that, then, this meeting is adjourned.
I'll call the meeting in the Lebanon Planning Commission to order. Please be standing for a flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And could we get the roll call, please? Commissioners Bashirs. Renovo? Here. Munn? Here. McLean? Here. Uh, Commissioner Gary Kunarowski is absent, as is Vice Chair Salvage and Chair Robertson. Here. Okay, has everybody had an opportunity to look at the minutes um, for Maple? Is there any corrections? I have one. Sorry. Under item three. Uh, says we approved the minutes for March of 2021. Oh, good grief. Did we or did we not? Probably not. <laughs> I, I think it was a test. <laughs> See if we were looking. I will fix it. See if this. we actually read them. So with a correction, we need a motion to approve with corrections. I'll make a motion to approve with a correction. Of the okay, is there a second? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right, we come to the part on our agenda where if anybody in our audience would like to approach the Planning Commission about something that is not on the agenda, this would be the time to do so. Seeing no movement, then we will move on. We have two public hearings tonight. We have a uh, comp plan map amendment and we also have a subdivision that we'll be addressing. But before we do that, and turn it over some cool legal stuff. Next hearing will be pursuant to the quasi judicial hearing procedures set out in, under Oregon law under ORS 1170.76. Commencement of the hearing, all commission members will be asked to announce any ex parte contact or contact information. Ex parte contact or contact is only outside of committee meetings or the property itself regarding any of the issues before the council. Conflict of interest is when a commissioner or member of the commissioner's family abstains to profit from the outcome or decision of the public. If you have any questions about either ex parte contact or conflict of interest, please bring them to the department. We will start out with the staff report, which will include information on staff needs to be relevant to identify criteria and determine a comprehensive plan, land use regulations, and which staff believe is relevant to the issues of the hearing. After the staff report, we will allow questions by staff of the commission. Uh, we will then open the meeting for public testimony. Testimony of witnesses is in the following order. We will start with applicants, any proponents of the applicant, as it is their burden of proof. Public testimony may be in either oral or written form and constitute concerning the issues relevant to the hearing. All testimony and evidence must be directed towards the criteria described in the staff report or other criteria in the comprehensive plan or land use regulations. For those providing public testimony, please state your name and address when you testify. Please note that failure to raise an issue, including a constitutional issue or other issues related to the proposed conditions of approval of this plan, accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the commission and the parties an opportunity to respond to the applicant, will preclude any appeal to the land use board of appeals. An issue which may be the basis for an appeal to the land use board of appeals shall be raised no later than the close of the record of the evidentiary hearing. Following the close of the public hearing, all remaining discussion will be held among the commission members. The commission may approve or deny the application or approve an application with conditions for approval that is supported by the facts of the case and the land use plan or regulations. If there are no questions, I will not take up any more time. I'll pass it over to the commission. Okay. So before I do that, just uh, be sure that your mics are on and when you speak, lean into them. Okay. So with that then, we will open public hearing CPMA-22-02. Uh, combined with ZMA-22-01 and ask if there's any conflict of interest, ex parte contact, or bias. Okay, say it again. <laughs> it should be a red dot. Is it now? Okay. I didn't know if I, if I, my husband did our, some work for Dave on that piece of property. So I don't know if I can vote on that. He, 
current, is he currently doing any work? Not right now. He he already finished the work, so. And then, I mean, did you leave the rear seats in the area where the front seats are going to be right after that? Oh, no. Okay. Well, I mean, as long as you're not working on the front seats, or remember, you said on the rear seats, you can work on the front seats. Okay. Yeah. So yes, you, based off this decision, do you have any financial outcomes in any way based off this decision? No. Okay. 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 So just a general rule, if in doubt, disclose. Yes. So yes. that's exactly what you did. Good, thank you. All right, if there's no other disclosures, then we'll turn it over to staff for a staff report. Okay, uh, good evening, uh, commission and members of the public. Before you tonight is a proposed comprehensive plan map and zoning map designation change uh, for a property that's located at 4070 South Sanium Highway. It is located on the weirdest intersection when you're trying to figure out directions, but it's generally the northwest corner of the, the intersection of South Sanium Highway and Crowfoot Road. The current comprehensive plan designation is residential mixed density. Um, and the proposed comprehensive plan designation was is mixed use. Uh, the property itself has not been res a residential use for an extensive period of time. I'm not sure if it ever was, uh, but it was previously utilized as the old Moose Lodge as a more commercial uh, designation itself. That Moose Lodge has since been demolished um, and the property has had some slight grading improvements and, and I think they're working towards putting up a fence. Um, there's no development proposed as part of this application, um, but uh, as been, has been disclosed for a justification for the change from residential mixed density to mixed use. It is the intention to utilize the property in an interim basis as a um, mini storage type facility for boats and RVs, which would be subject to a future application before the, the planning commission, um, and then a future potential redevelopment, which could include a mix of commercial and residential, uh, which would justify the need to move it to a mixed use designation. Um, and surrounding the properties um, is quite an extensive mix of uses, including an industrial use to the west, sorry, east-ish, um, and then residential uses to the south and the west, and then some commercial uh, uses uh, and some vacant land to the north. Um, in order to justify doing a comprehensive plan and map amendment for the zoning code, the city's public facilities need to be evaluated to determine whether or not it, it will create any impacts. Um, uh, on the slide, you can see where the existing utilities exist um, there is a 15 inch gravity main located in South Sanding Highway that could be connected to the property. Water would need to be extended, but would have the capacity to serve the subject property if it was extended from Cascade Drive down through Crowfoot. Um, and there is an existing storm drainage ditch that um, is available to the west and north of the property that upon any development would need to be improved for um, current storm drainage standards. Um, and so based off of the anticipated uh, or future proposed use and potential redevelopment and the size of the property, there's no amendments to the city public facilities that would be needed. Um, in terms of transportation, uh, the Crowfoot Road is considered a minor arterial and uh, South Sanding Highway is a primary arterial. Um, there is a planned road improvement in our uh, current transportation system plan that would require Crowfoot Road to be realigned to line up with Wyrick Drive to create a, an appropriate intersection uh, on the highway. Um, and then, so that would be triggered upon any future developments of the site. Um, and so there is an, an assurance that that would be provided as a future uh, improvement. Um, but the current change of the designation would not impact the transportation system uh, or that future project as there's no development proposed. Um, and then in terms of conversion of the land designation, it's currently zoned residential mixed density. It would move to mixed use, which would still allow for residential uh, use or commercial use as well. And based off of the um, 
several hundred acres of excess residential mixed density a designation. Uh, converting 1.7 acres would not result in any significant or uh, would mostly be a negligible impact to the housing uh, properties available in the city. So um, with that, that provides the justification for the amendments uh, as proposed. And so that would conclude my staff report and I'm available to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Any questions for staff? Uh, just one, you said the Crowfoot would be aligned to Wyrick? Yeah. Would that dissect through the property? Mostly on the <clears throat> northwest side of the right. property. So, so yes, there would be. Um, we've done a preliminary sketch that would sort of run the road along this portion mm -hmm. uh, of the property. Um, so yes, it would bisect the property. It would require um, some significant dedication of that property. But there would still be, I would say, at least over an acre of property left to be able to develop it. Okay, thank you. So there's some comment in there about dedication of the land um, once a development proposal comes in. Uh, walk me through that process. Is it the land is dedicated and then is there a purchase involved? Would mostly depend. There it goes. So it would mostly depend on whether the roadway is needed at that time of development. So let's say you were going to go in there and build, uh, just use an apartment complex for for instance. Um, if the the traffic warranted there, we weren't ready to have the intersection put in there to where we line up with Wyrick Drive. It'd just be a dedication, so you couldn't build anything on that. Okay. So at that point, you would probably dedicate that right away. Uh, if there was some development that required the uh, intersection to line up because it was going to generate a lot of traffic there, and maybe an apartment's not a good, a good example, uh, then they would be required to build that portion as a condition of development. Okay. Uh, now that's the nice thing about this is it's. Uh, TSP project out of the transportation system plan, but it would also be an SDC eligible project. Uh, so there's reimbursement credits or uh, for that matter, if the city, let's say something happened, I don't know, some big development <clears throat> and we said, well, we should probably align this intersection, then we could actually use SDCs to purchase that, uh, purchase the property from them at market value uh, at that time. So there's a variety of ways that that can happen. It's just it kind of depends on the nature of what the development is and when it's going to happen. So once that alignment happens then would the existing right of way be abandoned? Yes, yes and no, uh, because you've still got houses that would use Crowfoot there. Uh, so a lot of that would be reverted back. Uh, you would have to tie Crowfoot back into the Wyrick piece and, and whatnot. So. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Did you say that the landowner would be compensated for that? Yes, if the landowner comes to us and says, hey, I want to create a development here that um, would require that roadway, then they would be re at condition during development review that they would have to build that portion of the roadway. That, that would become an SDC project, system development charge to transportation because it is a transportation system plan. So they could receive credits uh, towards their transportation system development for whatever whatever they were proposing to build. Um, that's one way. And the other way would be is if, if we initiated that. If we initiated that, then we would likely buy the right of way at fair market value. It just depends on, on the scenario. Okay, any other questions? So I'm not sure this is the right time to bring it up before or after the testimony, but I'll just throw it out here. Um, it's inferred, I know this comp plan map amendment, but it's inferred, inferred that the um, use will be storage. Um, and there's a comment in here. Is that, I guess that what my question is, is that considered development? No, not necessarily with the, the understanding of the scope of, of what they would be doing for the storage, it, it would be uh, enclosing the property with a fence and then storing boats and RVs, which doesn't require a structure 
or, or regular occupancy of the site. And so I don't think that we would trigger that as development. Um, it is inferred that that is their, their proposed temporary use of the site until they determine at which point, which type of development they wanna do in the future, um, which would potentially be inclusive of a mixed use development, which justifies the mixed use designation. Um, the, the storage component still has to come before the, the planning commission as a conditional use permit within the mixed use zone. And so that will be considered at that time in front of the planning commission, which is why it specifically states that although that is identified proposed con conceptual plans to justify the change, that is not under consideration to, tonight for, for whether or not to, to approve the project or those proposed uses. Okay, so that was my question about whether that would trigger the infrastructure extension. Okay, good, thank you. Any other questions? All right, with that then, we will open the public testimony portion of our hearing and invite the applicant or the applicant's representative to come forward, sign in, state your name. Good evening, Lambert and Planning Commission. My name is Laura LaRock. I work with Udell Engineering and I'm representing the applicant who is also joining me here today. So why don't you introduce, introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, David Gillette and we own the property there at 407077. Okay, thank you. Well, as always, Kelly did a great job giving an overview of the application and the proposal before you. So I will just quickly recap and then we are both here and available to answer any questions that the Planning Commission might have. Um, so again, the proposal before you is a comprehensive plan map and a zone map amendment changing the designation of a property from a residential zone to a mixed use zone. Um, Kelly walked through the review criteria and um, essentially boils down to if the zone was changed, could it support the uses that are permitted within that zone? And as she mentioned, there's either public use facilities that are in place currently or could be extended to the site uh, at the time development occurs. Um, the other kind of criteria that you take a look at to say, is it appropriate? Um, so in the application material, and as you can probably see by driving down the site, uh, this really is the definition of a mixed use area already. There's an archery shop that's just the next door. There's a metal manufacturing business. Um, there's an industrial distillery that's right there in the area, uh, as well as residential homes. So it really has operated as a mixed use area already, even though the zoning uh, doesn't lend itself to it currently. Uh, and then the roadway dedication, I think that came up in the primary reason was just to mention that this property is pretty unique. It's gonna be bisected largely by roadways in the future. So even though the zoning pattern on the map wouldn't look perfect and have the zones next to each other, this really is gonna be isolated at the time development occurs. Um, so it gives some buffer, even if there were a residential development um, bordering the site uh, when future development occurs. Uh, and then I guess the last point I'll make is that we really took a, a hard look at the development code and the commercial types of designations that could have been requested, um, really kind of boiled down to us as a highway commercial zone or the mixed use. Um, so going through this application, we put together the permitted uses in each zone to just do a side-by-side -side comparison. And primarily the uses that are permitted in a highway commercial zone and the mixed use are very similar. Um, the only thing with the highway commercial zone is that it limits the type of residential development that can occur. Uh, it requires it to be uh, above or attached to a commercial structure. And in the mixed use zone, you get a little bit more flexibility with how those um, commercial and residential uses could be mixed on the site. Um, so it helps with when you're designing, especially on a site that's kind of irregular in shape. Um, so with that, we'll, I'll wrap up the presentation and uh, unless there's something you wanted to add. Okay, uh, and then we'll turn it over to you if you have any questions that we can help answer today. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. I just had one sure. quick yep. thing real quick. Um, I think in our DRT meeting, meeting under the current zoning, we talked about a host out there to, for extra security. Um, and that person, um, is it, would it be okay if that person did come out there? Because um, you know, it has septic, water, um, power, everything is there before, um, before the zone change. 
that's my question. Um, we can have that discussion outside of the, the scope of the, the hearing so that it's not a muddled uh, decision uh, for the hearing type area. Um, but, but we can discuss that and we, we've had preliminary conversations. Mm -hmm. Thank you for Thank your you. time. Thank you. Is there anybody else with us this evening that would like to speak in favor of the application? <clears throat> Is there anybody that would like to speak in opposition of the application? With that, then, we will close the public testimony portion of our hearing, and all further discussion will be amongst staff and planning commissioners. So what say ye? Any concerns whatsoever? I'm, I'm pretty glad that they tore down that nasty old building and and are improving the property. I mean, kudos to them. I know that they've spent a ton of money there on asbestos abatement and everything. And I think that we should, personally, I think we should do everything we can to accommodate the builder and get him on his way. Okay. Do you feel the criteria that was presented has been met? Okay. Everybody see your heads nodding yeah. affirmatively. So with that then, is anybody prepared to make an, a motion? I'll do it. Okay, Jen. <clears throat> I move that the Planning Commission recommend approval of the Comprehensive Plan and Zoning Map Amendments CPMA 22-02 and ZMA 22-01 to the City Council based on the written findings in the staff report and direct staff to draft an order of recommendation incorporating the findings and conditions of approval. Second it. Okay. Todd, uh, Todd seconded it. <laughs> it's been motion and second. Any further discussion? All those then in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Moving on to our second hearing. We'll open planning file S-22-02, including variance-22-02. Uh, and ask if there's any ex parte contact, conflict of interest, or bias. Okay, seeing none, then we'll turn it over to staff for a staff report. Good evening again. Uh, before you is a proposed nine lot subdivision for a property that is on the south side of Weldwood Drive and west of Cascade Drive. Um, the property is zoned mixed use, and for surrounding properties to the north, uh, and west are properties that are zoned mixed use and to the north is the Walmart shopping center to the west is the apartment complex that's finishing up development that was approved in 2020 and 2021. And then to the east and south uh, is property that's zoned residential mixed density and maintains a mobile home park and then further to the south is single family residential that's within the county designation. Um, there is public facilities um, and utilities uh, in the right of way and then also along an easement of the apartment complex property um, that the sewer water and storm drainage would be pulled to and through the property and then throughout the private street that's proposed. Um, in terms of the subdivision. As I said, it's a nine lot subdivision. Um, the way that it's proposed, there'd be four lots that would be directly adjacent to Weldwood and then five lots that would be um, to the south of the proposed private streets. Um, the property has been designed um, to minimize and limit the number of access points on Weldwood Drive. Um, so there is only a single access point, which is the private street that is proposed that would provide access to all of the properties. Um, so lots one, two, and three would be providing access um, on the private streets on the south side of their properties. And lot four would, it could either be on the, the private street side um, that's going north south or towards the, the southern part as well. Um, the properties are all designed to have a property uh, size of just over 5,000 to just under 6,000 net square feet. Um, which would accommodate either a single family detached residential dwelling um, or a duplex as is currently configured. Um, there are other types of housing um, developments that would be eligible for the size of the property as well. 
um, such as townhomes or zero lot line developments. Um, as discussed, there is a private street that is proposed for the north south section. The street is wider, that would provide a 40 foot intersection um, so that there is ability to do parking on both sides. And then on the east west, it is the standard required 32 foot uh, street width. Um, there are sidewalks proposed um, as required for the private street standard on one side of the private street. So you have it on the south side and you have it on the west side. Um, for private streets within our transportation system plan and our development code, it limits the number of dwelling units that may be accessed off of a private street to 16 dwelling units. Um, we have done some research to try to identify how and where that 16 units um, designation came from, and it uh, appeared to have been a policy decision um, when the, the, t the transportation system plan was being adopted with the required code changes. Um, and so there is a request um, for a variance from that maximum of 16 units to allow for a maximum of 18, so two additional units. Um, this is largely due to a restriction placed on the property that additional driveways should not be placed on Weldwood Drive. And so the access is only limited to this single uh, private street access. Um, if this property were located in another residential neighborhood off of a street that wasn't designated as a collector and already had multiple access points um, and the traffic flows that the street has, there would not be that same restriction placed on it. And so lots one, two, three, or four would have been able to have driveways facing onto the street. And so we are creating the, the restriction on this property by restricting the access on Weldwood. Um, and so the request is in exchange for that created restriction allowing for those two additional units beyond the, the 16 maximum, uh, which is the purpose for the variance. Um, and uh, I guess the key word would be the hardship is not being created by the property owner. Um, and so it's not their fault that that restriction is there. Um, so that further justifies the, the variance purposes. Um, so beyond that, there are easements that are proposed, which include private sewer easements, utility easements. Um, there would be a joint access and maintenance agreements for the maintenance of the private streets. Um, and then the storm drainage has been evaluated for the subdivision and included the storm drainage treatment on these two properties for lots two and three. So with that, I think that's the end of the, the slide presentation and I'm available to answer any questions. Is the reason, is the reason there's uh, no driveway uh, onto Wellwood Drive um, due to traffic uh, burden in the uh, street? So they're directly to, and Ron jump in anytime, directly to the west of the subdivision is the 140-ish apartment units. Directly to the north of it, there's access points for the Walmart shopping center. To the west of it directly, there's additional access points for the mobile home park and additional points for the, the shopping center as well. And so providing a, a access, um, a driveway, uh, in addition to the private street for these lots, our code allows for single family home and duple duplex properties to back up onto the street, which with that level of, of access and use of this uh, property with the amount of driveways that are already uh, on the property that creates a, a potential issue um, that we would rather avoid. And so there's that restriction for it to be on the private street. So on Weldwood Drive there, there was that median where you have a lane of travel going one way and then the other way. In the middle of the Weldwood, you have that median. Or is there going to be parking allowed on Wellwood Drive? Right? Okay. And then another uh, question I had was in lot number nine, uh, there's a, uh, uh, a sewer manhole there. Are you familiar with that, Ron? On lot nine? Yeah, right. I think it's uh, right, out, right out in lot nine, the lower left hand. 
one on the screen. Are you familiar with that? <clears throat> I'm not, but I'm pulling up off our sewer maps right now, so we can. Would that have to be redirected and changed, or what problems would that cause? Sewer going through the street. Well, it might be right about where the street is. I know it's right there in that area. Oh, uh, it's just a, so. So this is what. Uh, yeah, it's it's on the it's on the adjacent. <clears throat> Oh, okay, the right there where the, where the pointer is? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah, it's right there. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't see it up there either. I'm blind and have to pull things up and zoom in like this. But yeah, that's, uh, that's, that should not be an issue for us at all. Well, that would be an easy connect. Yeah. So typically we see a turnaround for emergency vehicles on a mm -hmm. private road. I don't see that on this. Is that... Does it qualify? The the road itself creates the the hammerhead. Okay, okay. I was just thinking when you're going down to lot nine, I, it's not required to go to lot nine to have a turnaround there. Then okay, based on distance. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Any other questions? If not then we'll open the public testimony portion. Ask the applicant or applicant's representative to come forward. Sign in. State your names, please. Hello again. So again, my name is Laura LaRock with Fudel Engineering, 63 East Ash Street here in town. And joining me this evening is Jeremy Kinzer. Jeremy Kinzer and developer of the property there. And you've both signed in already? I have not. Okay. Yep. Um, but our information is in the application submittal. So you'll have okay. to go through your record. Um, so again, thank you, Kelly and Ron, for answering questions that came up. Um, this one, to me, seems pretty straightforward, so I won't spend a, a ton of time on it. But... Again, the unique characteristics of this one is a two-part application, a subdivision proposal being the first part. Uh, the variance for the public or private street standards is the second. I think Kelly did a great job giving an overview about wh why the need is there. Um, so this one really is best facilitated by um, having access, driveway access to a private street opposed to one with higher road volumes coming out of Walmart. Um, and it really lends itself to a good design. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, with the distance new requirements from the fire code, it wasn't required to have a turnaround, and it really does operate as a hammerhead would, um, so they have adequate room to maneuver there. Um, otherwise, a pretty straightforward subdivision has connections to the water, sewer, storm. Um, it's going to add some curbing and some pavement, um, some drainage to allow those facilities to operate as they should. Um, with the development code and the zone in, they can be developed in single family or duplex dwellings. Um, and those meet all the lot standards that are in the development code for that zone and you know, for the development. So with that, I'll wrap it up, unless there's something else you'd like to add. Okay. And we'll turn it over to you for questions. Laura, you might have mentioned this, but I'm assuming reading between the lines that the intent is to put duplexes on all nine lots. I'm not sure if the actual development is known at this stage, but it would lend itself to either single family or duplex. Does confidently at this stage or not 100 yeah. percent, but yeah we're leaning towards the duplexes okay off street parking on each of the uh, lots as well uh, there'll be off street parking available for the north south section of the private road and then the east west they'll be parking along one side and as you mentioned kelly earlier that the road widths are a little bit different so uh, the north south section is a little bit wider and allows parking on both sides um, and then interior road running east-west is a little bit more narrow, uh, so limiting that to one side. Uh, but in addition, the development code would require um, two off-street parking spaces um, per dwelling. Per property. Per property, yes. Yeah. So they will have uh, like the garages and then driveways where parking could be accommodated as well. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And seeing nobody else in the audience, then we will close the public testimony portion of the hearing. All discussion will, between, between, <laughs> will happen between staff and commissioners. Any thoughts, any comments? Uh, Ron, I've only got one, and I hesitate to bring it up because we talked about it before, but um, kind of went away from signalizing uh, Cascade and Wellwood 
uh, as these developments occur, is there any talk about putting that back on the table? Uh, actually, we have Kittleson Engineering uh, looking at that right now. Oh, are you? We, we, so from, if you remember back from the uh, Colonial Pause development, it required some, or not required, but suggested some channelization out there at the Walmart entrance. Um, I think staff has looked at that and the cost to do that, which which it's not necessarily any one particular development. Um, we've decided to uh, actually look at that intersection again with Kittleson and there's potential for roundabout, there's potential for signalization, and they're looking at both of those at which time if they come back with a different recommendation other than what we have now, we would uh, probably recommend a an update to the TSP to include that. Okay. Uh, and, and look at moving that project forward again like that. Okay. So before we do any channelization. Okay. Yeah. So potentially it's back on the table. Yeah, it could be. Uh, they're they're doing the analysis on it for us right now. We actually hired them several months ago to to look at a couple of stuff. Done. Okay. And since the project didn't have any requirement for a TIA and isn't subject to that, I would suggest any discussion of that intersection and any questions we move to the planning commissioner's comment section and and make a decision on on the subdivision because that would not be a trigger or mitigation requirement okay. for this yes. subdivision. But I, I, we can absolutely pick up the conversation in the public comment, in the okay. planning commissioner's comment section. Well, roundabout sounds practical, doesn't it? Okay. Any concerns? Do you feel the criteria has been met? Yes. In seeing affirmative nods. All right, is anybody prepared to make a motion? Okay. Or you can do it. You I think Tina it? was getting ready to go for it. it. Okay. Um, I move that the Planning Commission approve the proposed subdivision F 22 02 for the nine lot subdivision and variance VAR uh, 22 uh, 02 to allow for two dwelling units above the maximum for a private roadway, adopting the written findings contained in the staff report with the conditions of development and direct, direct staff to draft an order of decision incorporating the findings and the conditions of approval. I will second that. <laughs> All right, it's been motioned and seconded. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you. All right, moving on then, commission business and comments. Do you guys want to continue the, the questions or any follow up with the Cascade Drive intersection? The only thing I would say, um, I kind of did that on purpose to get it in the record because in our previous discussion, wasn't there some type of a uh, an assessment for the uh, signalizing? Yeah, I believe I believe when the Tom and Dentistry went in, I'd have to go back and look. That was before my time as city engineer. Um, I believe they paid into a fund, uh, not a lot, for a signal there. Um, my gut tells me that there's going to be something more than just some channelization there. That's why we haven't actually pull the trigger on a project to do it uh, until we've got this report back from Kittleson so that we can we can get it right the first time. And I don't know what that includes. I think it's a really short, you got a short segment there. I don't know if you can get a traffic signal in there to work. Uh, I think that's, it, it, it could happen. Um, or if a roundabout would work and then you're gonna need more area. So we've, we've got them digging into both scenarios just to, just to make sure. You know, if, is it going to warrant something in 20 years or, you know, based on growth um, before we go out and channelize okay. and, and change some of that? So if I overstepped, I apologize. I just want to keep the record clean of, of if there was a discussion which would have resulted in a request to modify and add conditions. I wanted to make sure that that wasn't part of the, the hearing and the procedures for that specific application. Yeah. It, it's absolutely worth a, a conversation. I just have the requirement to keep the decision criteria clean. Okay. 
Good job. Um, planning commission interviews. Yes. Uh, so would you like to provide the update or would you like me to? No, go for it. Uh, we have an annual opening of the planning commission applications for anybody that would like to participate in the planning commission. Uh, if there are open seats, uh, we have interviewed two individuals. One is for in city. Uh, the gentleman's name is Dave Workman. Um, and then another one is K uh, Kristen Baxter, uh, who would be outside uh, UGB, um, which we don't currently have a seat available on. Um, it was a unanimous recommendation that Mr. Workman be recommended to participate in the Planning Commission. Um, he has an interest in the city as a whole, and so I think that the Planning Commission would be a good starting point for him. Um, and uh, learning about what we do as a board will, will be uh, an interesting prospect for him, but I think he'll, he'll be a good fit. Um, and then Kristen Baxter, uh, at such time as a position becomes available on the Planning Commission, um, there would be a recommendation to fill that, that spot. Uh, unless there is a significant delay between now and then, um, we would then open it back up uh, for any future uh, positions. But since we have the expectation or, or intention that there might be somebody leaving us shortly, um, we were able to, to interview her as well. And I think uh, she uh, is a real estate agent as well. So that would fill in the second position of real estate agent. Um, but is incredibly smart and, and level-headed and appeared to be um, coming in with no agenda and just a pure interest to serve. So it was also a very good conversation for her as well. So. When will they, uh, Mr. Workman, when would he start? The first meeting that he would be available to participate in would be the July meeting because technically with the opening, um, the appointments don't occur until the June. Yeah, yeah, what's wrong with that? All right, any other commission business comments? I assume we have a meeting next month. I assume we do too. <laughs> um, there's a likelihood of another subdivision um, and there is a potential for another application, but we're still working through some kinks with, with that one. So I don't want to disclose what it might be at this point in time. Um, so there's definitely going, well, we're at an 80% there's going to be a hearing next week, uh, next month. Um, and then I haven't talked about the housing production strategy or the economic opportunity analysis that's underway right now, mostly because there's no updates because everything is still doing the background studies and evaluation and catching themselves up on what the improvement is. So um, we'll anticipate doing some outreach uh, and work sessions in the summer when that one goes up. Anything else? Oh, one other thing. The, uh, the old mill property, what's the city doing on that? Nothing. <laughs> what's their fault? Nothing. Well, you got the police force guarding the place. We, we do not have any involvement that we can disclose at this time. Yeah, I, I spoke with BJ, the chief. I do not, I do not have any disclosing I can disclose at this time. <laughs> just, just to let you know. All righty then. Guess meeting is adjourned. <laughs>